Did you see who was named Times Person of the Year for 2023? Go ahead and say it out loud if you know it. Shout it if you can, because some of you know, and that's right, it was Taylor Swift. Now, I have to admit, when I saw that it was Taylor Swift, I was intrigued, and I read the article. Maybe not for the reason you thought. I read the article to see what insights I could gain onto into her relationship with Travis Kelsey. Now, I'm not a tra Taylor Swift fan, and I would never be confused for a Swifty, but I am a lifelong Kansas City Chiefs fan, and I wanted to know what I could find out about their relationship. But as I got into the article, that's not really what captured my mind. What captured my mind was listening to what Taylor Swift had to say about her preparations for her current tour. Six months before her current tour began, she began to prepare, and she would say this, every day I would run on the treadmill, singing the entire set list out loud, fast for fast songs, and a jog or a fast walk for slow songs. For six months before the tour began, this 33-year-old started intensive training. Now, fans of her record-breaking Eras tour have marveled at Swift's stamina. Her show lasts for about three, three and a half hours, and it includes 44 songs that she sings live, not to mention all of the dancing, in heels no less. Swift told the Time interviewer, she said, I knew this tour was harder than anything I'd ever done before by a long shot. So, I finally, for the very first time, physically prepared correctly. Wow. That's impressive to me. Knowing that by her own admission, she could no longer prepare for this tour like a frat guy in physical prep preparation, she prepared with intensity for six months. Did you know that there are verses in the Bible that say this, train yourself to be godly? Train yourself to be godly. Listen to this passage of scripture from 1 Timothy chapter four. Train yourself to be godly. So exercise yourself spiritually. No spiritual flabbiness, please. Workouts in the gym are useful, but a disciplined life in God is far more so, making you fit both today and forever. This is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Take it to heart. Now, as we've begun this Advent season, and even for weeks before Advent, we've been talking to you that we believe God is about ready to do a new thing. God is doing a new thing in our midst. And as he's doing this new thing, he's calling us to be ready to be prepared. And we've talked to you that it has to start in our hearts, then move to our homes so that it can be put on display for the whole world to see that King Jesus makes a difference in lives and that he's coming back soon. And so we want to talk to you today. I want to have a conversation today about your spiritual training and my spiritual training. And our spiritual training has to start with our cardio. Now, Taylor Swift would talk about that she did other things, weightlifting and some other conditioning things, but the main thing she wanted to do was the cardio on the treadmill. And our spiritual conditioning has to start in our hearts. And here's why. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. We have to train our hearts. Why? Jeremiah chapter 17, 17, 9 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our heart is sick and it's desperately desperately sick and deceitful. So we have to train our hearts for righteousness to be godly. Jesus on one occasion, it's recorded for us in Mark chapter seven, said this about the heart. He said, for from within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, from the heart, and they defile a person. So what's the solution if we're supposed to guard our heart above all else? If the heart is desperately wicked and evil and all of these things come flowing out of our heart, what's the solution? Well, it's heart training. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says this, In your hearts set Christ apart as holy by acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. One more time. In your hearts set Christ apart as holy. Acknowledge him. Give him first place in your lives as Lord. How do we train our hearts to give Jesus first place in our life? How do we set him apart as Lord? Well, for our conversation today, I want to break it down into four sections. I want us to like look at this about training our heart by taking a look at the birth of Jesus. I want us to look at that. There are four accounts of Jesus' life in the scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're, they, they bear the names of the men who, who told these accounts, who wrote these accounts, and they each give us a glimpse of the birth of Jesus. But when you put all four pieces of the puzzle together, they form a great picture of what I think heart training ought to look like, how we can guard our heart above all else as we begin to look 
at Jesus Christ, how we can acknowledge him, how we can give him first place in our lives and how we can really be trained. And maybe you and I can train like we've never trained before correctly for the very first time. Well, let's look at the Gospels. Matthew says that a heart that sets Jesus apart as Lord and gives him first place must, first of all, recognize. Recognize. What do I mean by that? Imagine you're standing by a red carpet. You've come to see a big movie premiere, and you're standing by the red carpet, and all of a sudden stretch limos start to show up, and the crowd goes wild, and star after star comes by, but you're still waiting for the headline star to arrive. Shortly, uh, after arriving, a hush falls over the crowd, and everybody's welcome to the star, uh, welcome the star, but nobody sees him. And a, a man walks down the red carpet unnoticed, and people don't do anything. They don't even take notice of this man, but he was the star. They didn't recognize this star because he had come, and they didn't know who he was. And people just stood there looking the other way. Well, Matthew wastes no time at all in his gospel, challenging it, his readers to recognize that Jesus is the Lord. He tells them that Jesus is the son of Abraham and that he is the son of David. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says this, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He wants them to recognize that he's the son of David. David was the one to whom the promise was made that the king of Israel will come out of you and there will never be a king not from you that doesn't sit on the throne, that David, one of his descendants, will rule and reign and be king. He's the son of Abraham, and the son of Abraham reminds us that he, the promise that came to Abraham is, I'm going to bless you, and through you, all of the nations of the world will be blessed. God is saying, if you want to do some heart training, your heart has to recognize that this promised king brings blessings to you and to the whole world, and he can bring you back into relationship with the God who you have ignored or who you have rejected. But it comes by understanding and recognizing that Jesus is the king and he comes to bring blessing. In Matthew's gospel, Joseph recognized it. He refuses to divorce Mary. Look at verses 24 and 25 of chapter 1. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home to be his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph did what the angel of the Lord commanded. He believed and he obeyed. He trusted the Lord and he did good. He did what was right. The Magi recognized that Jesus was this promised king, and they, when they saw the star, they went on their way, for they'd seen the star when it arose, Matthew chapter 2. They saw the star, and when they seen it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Do you see that? When they recognized the star, they followed, and they pursued, and they came to the place where Jesus was, and they recognized that even as a baby, he was the king, he was the one. And they bowed down, they worshipped, and they gave their gifts to the king because they recognized who he was. One of the things we have to ask ourselves is, do we recognize who Jesus is? That he is God's son who came to live a life of perfection and die a death on a cross. He came, God's word says that God demonstrated his love for us. And this, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Do we recognize him as the way, the truth, and the life? One of the other things we have to do is we need to understand we can recognize him in other ways. We recognize him by listening to what he has to say and by seeing him. In, in the world around us. I've been thinking a lot this Christmas season about a little song I learned as a little kid that said this, stop, look, and listen before you cross the street. Use your eyes, use your ears, then use your feet. And I think that's what it means to recognize we stop, we bow in front of him, we worship him, we praise him. We look all around us and see the evidence of his presence in our midst, that he is here, that he's the creator, that he's the sustainer, and that everything we have comes from him. We stop, we look, we listen, we go to his word, we see what he has left for us, we see what he has to say. We use our eyes, we use our ears, and then we use our feet and we go and obey. But one of the other places we recognize Jesus is in the people around us. We've talked to you over the last year and the last year and a half really about Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus comes back and it says he talk, starts to talk to people about who gets into heaven. It says he separates people. And, and what he does is he says, uh, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. Uh, when I was a stranger, a foreigner, you welcomed me in. When I was a prisoner, you came and uh, visited me. And the people say, when did we see you like this? And Jesus says, when you did it for the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. And to the other group, he says, 
When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was hungry, when I was thirsty, you didn't give me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. When I was a prisoner, you didn't come visit me. Jesus, when did we see you that way? And Jesus said, when you see the least of these and you don't do it for them, you treat me as if you're not doing it for me. We have to recognize that Jesus is present. We stop, we look, we listen, and we look at the people around us. If you want to know if your heart's healthy, is there room in your heart to recognize Jesus and the people that he loves? And do you love them the way that he loves them? But it's not enough just to recognize the blessings that Jesus brought to the world. It only makes a difference if we do what Mark says. Mark's gospel says a healthy heart has to go through the daily exercise of the discipline of repenting. We must repent. It's strange when we look at God, the Gospel of Mark because it's going to look like he has nothing to say about Christmas, about the birth of Jesus, because he doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus. He begins with the birth of John the baptizer. Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. If you want to have a healthy heart, if you want to exercise your heart uh, maybe properly for the very first time, you have to have a heart that understands what it means to repent. Jesus makes it possible to be in a relationship with the God we ignore and the God we reject, but we have to repent. We need to be saved. We need to acknowledge that we've sinned against him. We must recognize and admit that we're not going his way, that we are not the people we are supposed to be nor that we should be. We must turn to God and acknowledge our need 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 says this, uh, They themselves report how you, this is repentance, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's repentance. You turn to God from idols, whatever it is that's capturing your heart, to serve the living and true God. We repent. We admit that we have a need for a Savior. In that passage of scripture from Mark chapter 1, Mark's quoting from Isaiah, he tells us, and he says, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. The quote comes from Isaiah chapter 40. Let me read it for you. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight, make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what it means to repent. So I just want to ask you, if you want to do some heart work of repentance, you turn to God from idols to serve. And one of the ways you begin to serve, first of all, is that the valleys of defeat in your life have to be filled in. Valleys in the physical world are depressions and divisions, and they represent the places in our life where you feel defeated. And those are maybe too numerous to mention. And if you're honest, you know right now where you feel defeated. Maybe there's a sin that you continually give into. Maybe there's something going on and just over and over and over again, you feel defeated. It says we, part of the spiritual workout to prepare our hearts, to guard our hearts, to make our hearts spiritually healthy is we have to fill in these valleys of defeat. We need to remember that we don't work for victory. We work from victory. That greater is he that lives in you than he that lives in the world. And what Jesus has done as he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, after I go away, I'm going to send another one. The spirit will fill you with power and you'll be able to overcome every area of your life where you feel defeated. The valleys of defeat must be filled in. The mountains of disbelief have to be leveled. Mountains represent obstacles. And I would just say this, mountains of disbelief represent that doubt. And if we want to have a spiritually healthy heart, we need to do away with all of the doubt and unbelief. Doubt and unbelief, I believe, spring from pride. So the heart exercise that's needed here to, to get rid of doubt is to learn how to humble ourselves. Scripture says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Where are you doubting? Where are you refusing to trust God? Do the heart work, train properly, spiritually, maybe for the first time, maybe like never before. And then it says, the crooked ways have to be straightened out. I put it this way, the crooked ways of dishonesty have to be straightened out. Maybe in your life it's lying, maybe it's, it's hypocrisy. Maybe there's just something that's dishonest and the heart discipline to overcome dishonesty is confession. The scripture says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. God says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is good for the heart. It's, it's heart exercise. And then it says that the rough places have to be smoothed out. I call these the rough, rough places of disconnection. They're kind of like the, the ruts in the road. You get in a rut and you find yourself traveling there. I would say that 
this talking about the rough places being smoothed out is talking about disconnection. It's talking about not living in community. It's talking about relationships. And I would challenge you, one of the heart exercises, one of the places where you need to, to exercise your cardio, spiritual muscles, is to get plugged into community. For those of you that are in the house church, that's a great step. For those of you that aren't in house church, that are resisting community, this is a spiritual exercise that strengthens your heart, living life in community. Every Thursday night, we gather at a home, and we have a meal, and we share the Lord's Supper, and we do it with people that we know and people that we don't, people that speak our language, people that don't speak our language, people that look like us and people that don't look like us. I'd encourage you, if you've never been to one of our Thursday night uh, meals, community meals, that you come and you be a part. And if you can't make one, I challenge everyone that's listening to me today, make the one on Thursday night, December 21st. It is going to be extraordinary. Be on the lookout. If you receive emails from Miami Valley, you'll be getting information. If you don't receive emails and you want more information, just uh, email us at start at miamivalley.com, start at miamivalley.com, and we'll tell you more about this community meal and how you can be a part, not just on the 21st, but every Thursday night. But let me encourage you, make time and plans to be there on the 21st. Well, if you've done that, if you've recognized and made your heart to a place where it recognizes Jesus, if you've made time to practice the spiritual disciplines of repentance, Luke says that there's a third thing that a heart that says Jesus apart as Lord uh, and gives him first place must do, and that's rejoice. Rejoice. Have you ever watched one of those surprise military homecoming videos? They're all great, but especially the ones that take place around the holidays where the children are in school and they're just singing Christmas carols or they're just doing Christmas things. And maybe they're even uh, preparing a message for their parent who's serving overseas. They sing a few songs and all of a sudden the door behind them opens and the parent is home and they turn around and they see their mom or they see their dad and the scene is priceless and the children explode in joy and run to their parent. And it's the best, best present of the day. It's the best present of Christmas. And there's just this choice to rejoice. If we make this choice to rejoice, we do it like Mary did. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried down to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her room, womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. You see where joy comes from. It comes from this belief that God has promised and God is faithful and he will fulfill every promise that he has made to you. And the baby leaps and as Elizabeth finishes what she says, Mary sings a song, verses 46 and 47. She says, my spirit rejoices my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. There is just this time of joy and learning this discipline of rejoicing, choosing to rejoice is important. In Luke chapter 2, verse 20, the shepherds rejoiced and praised God for all they had seen and heard. That's what the scripture said. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. God promises, God speaks, he fulfills his promises, he does what he says, and we rejoice we recognize, we repent, and we rejoice. Earlier in chapter two of Luke, chapter earlier in Luke chapter two, verse ten, uh, got some more words to the shepherds. The angel said to them, "Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And so they go in and they find everything exactly as it was said. And we can rejoice." The birth of Jesus is the birth of a Savior to take away our punishment. He would live a life of perfection and he would die death on a cross. He came to bring you back into the relationship with a God you have ignored or you have rejected. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 say this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considered in all you do, remembering the Lord is coming soon. There is a spiritual exercise that's needed for our hearts to be healthy and it's learning the discipline of rejoicing regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. One translation says, let everyone see that you are gentle. And sometimes it's they see our gentleness when they hear our words. A gentle answer turns away wrath. We need to practice gentleness and compassion and understand that regardless of the circumstances, if our heart is healthy spiritually, we can rejoice. 
But there's one more thing to do. You recognize, you repent, you rejoice. But in John's gospel, John says a heart that sets apart Jesus as Lord, that gives him first place, is a heart that must receive. When we lived in southwestern Pennsylvania, a mining community, there was a mining accident, leaving some miners trapped under the surface of the ground. And the workers came and they began to build a tunnel to where the miners are. And it took them five and a half days to get to the miners before the miners could see light and before the miners were rescued. When the rescuers arrived to the miners, every miner had a choice. They could come and go with the rescuers up towards the daylight or they could stay in the darkness. Guess what? Every miner chose to come to the daylight. John chapter 1 verse 9 says this, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That was Jesus. That's John's account of the nativity that Jesus came, that he was the light of the world, and he came to give light to everyone because the world was filled with darkness. And it's the light of Jesus that illuminates and gets rid of all the darkness. And the choice, however, here is, will we receive or will we reject? John says the heart that does spiritually healthy things gets in the practice of receiving. John chapter 1, verse 10 says this, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He's offered us a gift. He's offered us the light. He's offered us salvation, but he's not going to force it. And our choice is, will we ignore it, will we reject it, or will we receive it? Maybe the most well-known Bible verse of all comes from John's Gospel, chapter 3. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but receive everlasting life. Do you see that's the message of the gospel? God loves and God gave. We believe and we have to receive. It's not enough to recognize. It's not enough to repent. It's not enough to rejoice, but we must also receive. What happens if you do receive it? Verse 12 of John's gospel says this, to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God, the greatest status of all. We have his heart. We have his heartbeat but we need to receive him. The good news of the gospel is regardless of who you are or what you've done, if you recognize who Jesus is, if you repent, if you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, if you rejoice, if that's your attitude, if you receive his gift to you, you will be saved. And you can train yourself to do what Peter says. Let me read it one more time. In your hearts, set Christ apart as holy by acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. Taylor Swift said that the main reason she prepared like she did for this last tour, the reason she put six months in on the treadmill and she sang every song while she exercised was for all of those people who would come to her show. For all of those people who would work so hard and pay so much to attend, she didn't want them to be disappointed. The gospel reminds us that God paid the ultimate price for our salvation. He gave his one and only son who died, who died a death on a cross. And I would submit to you this Christmas season, this Advent season, that it ought to be worth our effort to maybe, for the very first time spiritually, to prepare our hearts correctly, to recognize, to repent, to rejoice, and to receive, to trust the Lord and do good. Maybe those haven't resonated in you. Maybe I should put it to you this way. Instead of four R's, let me give you three A's and I'll be done. If you want to prepare your heart spiritually, maybe for the very first time, first of all, there has to be an awareness that Jesus is who he said he was, the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except by him. Do you, are you aware of Jesus and who he is, and are you aware of Jesus in every face that you meet? There's awareness. Secondly, there's adjustment. That's repentance. I adjust. My heart's not always right. I do things that are wrong, and I need to repent, and I need to do away with those places in my life where I feel defeated, where I feel doubt, where I feel disconnected. I need to do the hard work, awareness, adjustments, and finally, attitudes. The choice to rejoice. Friends, this week I've been with people who've told me their hearts are heavy, their hearts are hurting, and that their hearts are breaking. And maybe you'd say the same thing today. And I would submit to you this Advent season, as God's beginning to do a new thing, it has to start in your heart. And the best way it can start in your heart is by you saying, I will set apart in my heart, I will set apart Christ as Lord, acknowledging him and giving him first place in everything I do. Almighty God, thank you for the clarity of your word. Father, you're doing a new thing and it has to start in our heart. 
and our heart needs to be right with you. Father, forgive us for those times we've ignored you or we've rejected you. Father, we would ask you, we acknowledge, we recognize Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. We recognize that his life was a life of perfection and ours never can be, that he became the substitute sufferer. So we repent, we turn to you from everything else that has place in, first place in our heart and we give our lives to you and we will serve you. We will do the hard work, maybe for the very first time, of making sure our spiritual hearts are, he are healthy. And Father, this holiday season, this Advent season, we will choose to rejoice. Whatever our circumstances, we will rejoice because you bring good news of great joy into every situation, into every setting, even if it's confusing, even if it's hard. And God, this day, I pray that each one who listens will receive. They'll receive Jesus into their heart as Savior. They'll receive his presence, the Holy Spirit, to walk with them, to care for them, to comfort them, to be their guide. And Father, I pray that they will receive every gift that you have for them this season. Father, we are aware. Help us make the needed adjustments. And may our attitude this season be an attitude to say, yes, I will receive and I will rejoice in the good news of Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen.